Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. I'm so glad you joined us today as we continue an important series of studies on Christ and His law. How a correct understanding of what Christ desires for us can change our lives completely. Our topic today, Christ, the end of the law. A topic that's misunderstood by many people. I know the Holy Spirit's going to guide us to a clear understanding of God's Word today. And I'm so glad that you joined us. I want to welcome our Hope Sabbath School team. What a great series of studies this has been, hasn't it? Yes. I just, I find myself saying, I want to love God with all my heart. Amen. And, and love those around me too. And we're so glad that you're here as part of the team. We're excited. We have one of our team members teaching the class today. And I'll introduce him in just a moment. But I also want to thank you for joining us, part of our Hope Sabbath School family around the world. And it brings us such joy when you write to us. You can write to sshope at hopetv.org. We share that not only with our whole team here, but with the media team as well, because we're all part of a miracle that God is working. So thanks for writing to us. Maybe you've written before. Share how God's blessing you. Maybe you've started teaching the Word. We'd love to hear from you and be able to share that encouragement together. So sshope at hopetv.org is our address. And here's a note from Bessie in uh, Maryland. And actually, she wrote to us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So you can go to our Facebook page in Hope Sabbath School, and if you click like, we all smile. <laughs> and I think we're 46,000 or something. That's a lot of likes, isn't it? Amen. But Amen. praise God, many are studying the Word with us and connecting through Facebook. And he Bessie writes and says, I've been watching Hope Sabbath School for a year now, and I've experienced nothing but blessings. Amen. <laughs> the study this week, I felt the Holy Spirit was with you, and I felt the Holy Spirit with me too. Praise yeah. God. It's a miracle, isn't it? Yes. I only wish in God's will that I could join you someday and meet each one of you in person. Please continue to praise God and not fall into the darkness of this world. Amen. I'm praying that God will use each one of you to bring people closer to Him. Amen. If it's not selfish to ask, Bessie says, would you pray for me? Amen. Amen. I'm an evangelist, a teacher, and soon to be a deaconess in my church. Amen. Amen. Would you pray? How many of you pray for Bessie? Amen. All right, Bessie, you see some hands waving at you right now. <laughs> God has been good in so many ways we don't deserve. Praise God for Hope Sabbath School. And if I don't see you in person, let's meet in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Well, Bessie, thanks for writing to us. And we're so glad that you're not just a passive observer, but you're an active participant in what God's doing in the world. And we're glad Hope Sabbath School is part of that miracle. Rose writes to us from Jamaica. Thanks for writing, Rose. And she says... Hi, Hope Sabbath School members. Hi. Hi. Anybody from Jamaica? Hi. Elaine raises her head. <laughs> Greetings to a fellow Jamaican. Rose uh, says, I'm happy to join you every morning for the Bible study. So she's on watching our Daily Hope, which is our daily Bible study. Sometimes when I used to study the Bible lesson myself, I didn't understand it very well. But I understand it better when I study with you. Amen. Amen. And I can see a change in my spiritual life. Amen. God bless you very much. And she says, wave to all Hope Sabbath School members. <laughs> well, we'll wave back to you. <laughs> and uh, thanks for being part of our Hope Sabbath School Rose there in Jamaica. Just a short note from Shadrach in Zambia. And says, Shadrach says, I thank God Almighty for Hope Sabbath School, which has given me an interest in studying my Bible every day. Isn't that beautiful? I also like to sing the scripture songs. I sing them when I'm going to church and when I'm going to work. And now I'm even able to teach a Bible class myself. Amen. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's why sometimes on Hope Sabbath School, we ask one of our team to teach the class because we're praying that God would raise up 10,000 teachers. Yes. Amen. Or should we ask for 100,000? 100,000. <laughs> and that God would use us all to impact many lives for Him. Shadrach, thanks for writing. And we pray God would bless you as a teacher. And here's a short note from Belgium. Thanks for writing to us, David. 
And David says, with the in-depth study of the scriptures, you are affecting many souls for eternity. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Your Hope Sabbath School has been used by God to change my life. Amen. 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 So it's good not to just change lots of wow. people, but to change us. Yes. Change your own heart. God bless you all. Well, thanks for writing, David, from Belgium. And one last note from Nigeria, from Nkem, N-K-E-M, Nkem, in Nigeria. And Nkem says, I really thank God for Hope Sabbath School. What fascinates me the most when I watch the program is the beautiful songs that you sing. <laughs> well, we're not a choir, are we? No. But we like to hide God's word in our hearts yeah. and to encourage other people to Amen. do that. Amen. My time studying with Hope Sabbath School is about the only time I get to study these Bible lessons. So may God bless you all real good. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, Nkem, for writing to us from Nigeria. And we love those scripture songs too. In fact, we've got a new song for this series on Christ and His law. It's really the heart of the studies from Matthew 22, 37 to 39. Let's sing it together. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We're learning this now. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Powerful principles of truth we're singing here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I really believe that the Spirit of God impressed my wife Bodil to choose that scripture song for this series. Amen. Amen. Because that song summarizes the whole series of studies, yes. Christ and the law, yes. that we would be not only saved by His grace, but transformed Amen. Amen. to love Him with all of our hearts Amen. and to love those around us Amen. in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm excited today because uh, as we begin our study, we have one of our team members who's going to lead us in a study of God's Word. And Chuck, God bless you as you lead us in prayer and as we study the Word of God together. Thank you, Pastor Derek. Greetings, Hope Sabbath School members. Let us pray as we get started. Father in heaven, we are praying as always that as we open your Word, as we share as fellow believers, that your Holy Spirit will be here, that it will teach us and draw us ever closer to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 There's a startling statement that is made by Paul in Romans chapter 10. I'd like to go there as we start. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. And I'm wondering, uh, Tricia Lee, if you would be willing to read that for us as we get started. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ, the end of the law. What is Paul saying here? What is he trying to tell us? That's kind of a startling statement. What does it mean Christ is the end of the law? Ulrich. Um, you, if you look at the context uh, in which he was speaking in here in, in Romans, uh, I think many misunderstood this statement to think that uh, because of Christ, the law is abolished and done away with when he himself stated that that was not his purpose. So the word here for end in the original language in the Greek speaks of 
purpose. It's like you're doing something and someone asks you, what is the end of all of this? They're, they, they're trying to ask you, what is the purpose you're doing this? So Paul is using that kind of phraseology to speak here that Christ is the purpose of the law. So this isn't saying now that I can worship idols and steal and, and do things like that. Right. No. Seth and then Nathan. I, I think another way of saying it is that uh, the purpose of the law is to make us like Christ. Mm. Okay. Okay. I think yes. it's important, Chuck. Sometimes people just read part of a verse, you know. Yes. Uh, it, it doesn't say Christ is the end of the law. I'm glad. Because as, as was pointed out, Christ said, I have not come to destroy but to fulfill. Mm -hmm. uh, what it says is that Christ is showing us that he's the end of the law for righteousness. Mm -hmm. If we think that somehow we're going to be set right with God by our law keeping. But let me say there's some very sincere Christians who struggle with this text and maybe think that it is saying that the law is just uh, totally done away with. Definitely. Yes, Nathan. I, I also think it's important to read it in context because it says that Paul's speaking about people who have a zeal for God in verse 2. They really want to please God, but then he goes on to say it was according to their knowledge, but not the full understanding. In verse 3, he says they don't have a knowledge of the true the way to find righteousness. And then uh, telos, as, as uh, Ulrich referred to, it means kind of a completion or a fulfillment, not that it's ended, it's over. You want to see what righteousness looks like? You will see completion of righteousness in Christ. Amen. He's the completion of righteousness. Amen. He shows us what it's like. We can't do that on our own. Amen. You know, I'm going to ask a question we've already looked at in our Sabbath school lesson so far. Is it possible for me to attain righteousness via keeping the law? No. 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 You're looking at me. Are you? What does that mean? I can't keep it via keeping the law. Is it possible for me to attain to righteousness via Christ? Yes. 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 Now, without Christ, can I? No. 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 Okay. With that being, what is, uh, do we fall short of God's ideal? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Constantly. And I'd like to look at two texts in Romans chapter 3, if that's okay. Uh, Romans 3.23. And I'm wondering, Bliss, if you would read that. And, and also, I'd like to look at Romans 3.10 right after that. Okay. And I'll be reading from the uh, King James Version of the Bible. Romans 3.23, and the Word of God says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, let's look at Romans 3.10 before we comment on those two. And mm -hmm. um, Missy, would you read that? I'm reading from the New King James Version. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Wow. Mm -hmm. So... No one is righteous. No one receives any kind of righteousness. Um, have any of you met a righteous person? It, I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving some open-ended questions here. I'm kind of wanting to see what kind of response we have. I want to respond to that. When, when it says there's no one righteous, is that saying that we've never done any righteous thing or that when we look at the record of the life that we're flawless? Um, I don't know because it would seem to me that even in the Christian life, there are many times I do something that's righteous and, and other times when I might fall. And there's examples in Scripture of people like that. But I don't know. Is it, is it saying that everything we did all along was bad or that we've fallen short of God's ideal, which mm. is that we would perfectly reflect the beauty of his character at all times? I think if we look at the example of Peter, it'll give us a little bit more insight. Uh, because Peter's showing two different parts of his personal experience. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of you will be able to relate to Peter's experience. Um, let's look at that. Matthew 16, verse 15 and 17. We'll start with that. And then we'll go to John chapter 6. So Matthew 16, verse 15 and 17. And Ulrich, would you be willing to read that for us? Uh, Matthew 16, verse 15 and 17, reading from... Uh, the King James Version. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood had not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Powerful. Peter here has been asked, um, it says, I believe that you are the Son of God. 
And Jesus' response is, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. God has shown you this. Is this a good experience in Peter's life? Yes. Yes. Amen. That's Amen. beautiful. I would love to have Jesus say, you know, God has revealed this to you, Chuck. Praise God. <laughs> we love that. Um, I'd like to look at another experience. John chapter 6, verse 67 through 69. And Lloyd, uh, would you be willing to read that passage? That's John 6, 67 to 69. And I'm reading for the NIV version. 67, you do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the worlds of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Mm. Powerful. You know, as I listen to uh, Peter making this statement, I get excited. Peter is saying, I know that you are the son of God. Mm. I, I believe that you're the only person. Where would I go if I leave you? Mm. Uh, truly a statement of faith. Mm. Amen. But Peter doesn't always have this kind of experience, does he? Mm. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, and this is a longer passage, um, but I, I believe we're going to read through it to give us an understanding of what's taking place in Peter's life. Matthew 26, 69 through 76, a recounting of Peter in the last uh, day of Jesus' ministry here. Yes. Uh, Seth, would you be willing? Sure. Okay. Um, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and the servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Mm. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word, the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Mm. 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 Thank you for reading that passage. Mm. Um, I, oftentimes people could say how they relate to Peter. I feel like Peter. I feel like I've been him before. Um, how many of you feel like you can relate to Peter's experience? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in one day you're on cloud nine, you and God are having this great experience, you're praising God all day long, and then the next day it seems like the very ground has fallen out underneath you and you're lost. Mm -hmm. Somehow you're not making a, uh, you're not living what you know is right, and mm -hmm. have you felt like that way before? Mm -hmm. yes. And if you want to share experience that you could relate to that experience, I'd, uh, nothing too personal, but <laughs> something you'd be willing to share. <laughs> yeah, Stephanie. I can't say that I've, never or that I've ever said I don't know the man mm -hmm. yes but I I know that there's been times in my life where my experience has revealed that my relationship with Christ was not solid yes and it's been different experiences it's been more like I just haven't represented his character as I know I should okay yes thank you um, Nathan, I saw you raise your hand. Well, I was just thinking that what I learned from this, and, and I've experienced it myself, is that we do have those highs and lows in our spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. There's times when we feel like, you know, I'm really connected closely, mm -hmm. but we can't ever trust in ourselves. Yes. Peter did it when he was Amen. walking on water, yes. right? That's mm -hmm. right. Look at me, guys. And, and Elijah, look what his experience was, mm -hmm. too. You know, same kind of a thing. So we learn from that. But the beautiful thing that I see is that Christ welcomed him back. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Nathan. Pastor Derek. You know, I, uh, Chuck, I, I went to public high school, and if you'd asked me, are you a follower of Jesus, I would have said yes. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember painful memory, and painful because of my own failure. Mm -hmm. I remember painful memory. I was going to church. And as I was walking down the road close to the door to the church, one of my high school friends was walking on the other side of the road. And, you know, the idea would have been to say, hey, you want to come to church? You know, you want to learn more about Jesus? 
but I remember, and I, I was probably maybe 16 years old, and, and I'm ashamed to say this, but I remember turning my head and, and hoping he didn't see me. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Uh, as I, you know, and here I'm going into church. But I, I think that whole action, and I remember it back, revealed that I knew about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. But I didn't really know him. Mm. Yes. I certainly wasn't walking in the newness of the spirit. Yes. Yes. Uh, so that that experience for me, just you know, people probably thinking how terrible, but maybe some can relate to that too in different Absolutely. ways, and just say, wow, when I really look at myself, I really, I need a savior. Yeah. Amen. Have you sensed in your own life that your righteousness isn't good enough? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the time. I know it's rhetorical, right? I think all of us have felt that. Uh, human righteousness does not measure up to the ideal that God has. Mm -hmm. It's just impossible. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to look at a few passages that talk more about that. Uh, the first one is Romans 9, verse 30, through Romans 10, verse 4. And Juliana, would you be willing to read that for us? Um, Romans 9, 30 through Romans 10, 4. Yes. From the New King James Version. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? because they did not seek it by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Mm. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What a passage. Mm -hmm. Paul is being very clear here about those who are actually seeking for their own righteousness and they don't get it, and then those who are not seeking do get it. What's Paul trying to say here? <laughs> what is Paul trying to make clear to us in this passage? Mm. Mm. They were seeking it the wrong way. Um, they kind of had like, the, you know, the, the checklist approach. Okay. Um, they had a lot of rules. They even added their own traditions into the law of Moses as well. And, they, you know, they had a whole kind of rank of, you know, if I can attain to this level of keeping these rules and regulations, that I'm somehow better than another person. So if I try hard enough, I just can't do it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if I have a checklist. Even if you have a checklist. I don't, maybe some of you are not checklist. I'm a checklist person. I kind of <laughs> like to write a list on my desk. I'm doing this today and this today and this today. And I've actually approached my Christian experience sometimes like that. Mm -hmm. Hey, I did okay today on this area and this area, and I, I didn't get mad at my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> is that what God's talking about here? Mm -hmm. Does it work? No. Mm -hmm. According to this passage, how is one supposed to achieve righteousness? Through faith. Through faith. faith. Through faith. Through faith. Through faith. Jesus, Christ. Jesus Christ. Yes, Ulrich. If you notice with this passage, uh, Paul is not saying that the law is bad. No way in this passage is he saying it is bad, but what he's actually saying to his brethren is that your idea of establishing your own righteousness through uh, obedience to the, the checklist every day is not going to attain to that righteousness that God is looking for, which is through Jesus Christ, because your righteousness is empty of the heart transformation that needs to take place, which actually leads to you doing good. So in essence, the law is a law of love. It is love that leads you into the obedience to maintain the relationship, not the other way around. Mm. Now, we're, we're taking the word righteousness, and I'm sorry, Juliana, go ahead. No, I was uh, going to say that there's often a phrase that people say that we miss the forest for the trees. Mm, yes. uh, we, we tend to be so focused on something that we forget the purpose of why we're there. I mean, this, right. If you hear the story of the Taj Mahal and why it was being built was to honor 
a most precious wife and then by the time it was built it was completely forgotten that she it was even about her and it was just oh let me just make this great building and it had to be rediscovered and it, you know sometimes we are so focused on wanting to do right and doing things the way they should be that we forget why Purpose, Thank right. you. I, I appreciate mm -hmm. that reminder. You know, we've been using the word righteousness quite a bit. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Could, could someone just give me a layman term of what is righteousness? Mm. Yes. Well, uh, I'm going to answer that in perhaps a different way. <laughs> okay. Because as I'm reading this, and it's, he's speaking to his brethren. Yes. He loves them. Yes. He's not trying to beat them up, right? Yes. He loves them. He wants them to be saved. But he says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. And I want to suggest that that God's righteousness is a person mm -hmm. and they don't know about Jesus mm -hmm. they don't mm -hmm. know because he, he he's wanting to tell them about the one that's a stumbling stone to mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. he is God's righteousness he is all of the righteousness of God embodied mm -hmm. in a person who's going to save us and transform us yes and Amen. and I think back to what Juliana was saying, one of the tragedies is, is growing up in a religious family mm -hmm. or maybe even a Christian family where we have so many things that we think we're supposed to do that we forget what we really need mm -hmm. is a living relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is God's righteousness. Now I think that's going to change the way I live. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we try to change the way we live without having that living connection with God's righteousness. So yes. I would define righteousness as a person, mm -hmm. Jesus. He is God's righteousness. Mm -hmm. When we speak about our own righteousness, hmm. is that also a person? Or is it, because I'm definitely connecting with the fact that Christ is our righteousness, he is mm -hmm. righteousness. But what about our own righteousness, Trisha? I think about reconciliation. I think about in the beginning that we were made in God's image and that there was no sin there. And then when that sin appeared, we were separated, that we weren't in that communion, we weren't in that fellowship because we were now kind of, you know, tainted now. And at the end, we are trying to get reconciled again so that we can kind of be in Christ, you know, we can kind of be in God's presence again. And so when I think about my own righteousness or my own works, those works are never sufficient enough to reconcile me back to God. So again, I still need his righteousness through him, Christ, him actually working in me and reconciling me or building, bridging that gap again. Yeah. So it still goes beyond the actual actions that I'm doing to back to the relationship of me knowing this person, being like him, mm. being transformed into his likeness and his character, just like it was at the beginning. Wow, I think you. that's kind of how I understand it. Okay, thank you. Um, Missy. I see observing the law alone for what it is as something that's very static, where there's no growth, it's just that checklist, it's very stale. When you add the element of a relationship with God, everything changes, yes. everything comes to life, yes. and everything has meaning and purpose. And so and you also have a, a connection with the teacher who teaches us, teaches our hearts what we should feel and think and do. Amen. Thank you. Bliss, I saw your hand. I think um, the Bible says, by their fruits ye shall know them. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to our own righteousness, I think there's a danger in us trying to self-examine our good works or our righteousness. I think the Lord reveals that through other people. So we should, we should be focusing on Christ and His righteousness and in looking to Him. Mm -hmm. That is what's going to come out through us if, if we're open to the Spirit. So I think it's, it's important for us to, to balance that out in, in, in accordance with uh, the works of, of the law and, and righteousness. Thank you, Bless. Okay, Elaine. Um, going back to previous lessons in the series, we learned that our righteousness is like filthy rags. And when we compare it to Christ's righteousness, it humbles us. It makes us feel like nothing, you know. So our strength and our and that's why we need to develop diff a better relationship with Christ because we're nothing, you know. And when we get to that stage that we're nothing, then we can have a closer walk with God who is everything. Amen. You know, Eileen, I think that is the key stepping stone for leading to the next text I, uh, we were going to share with our Hope Sabbath School class, and that is Luke chapter 18. Uh, realizing our righteousness, what it really is, and then what God's really is, uh, takes us to a whole other level of experience. 
And Julia, would you be willing to read that? Sure. Uh, Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. Absolutely. And I will be reading from the New International Version, Luke 18, verses 9, starting verses 9 through 14. To some who were confi confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the other man, <laughs> robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector st stood at, at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be uh, exalted. Amen. 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 Who was justified? <laughs> the, the, tax the, tax the tax collector. The tax collector. The tax collector. Um, the word justified means he received the righteousness of Christ. 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 Mm -hmm. So here is a, a really messed up individual mm -hmm. who has received righteousness and is accepted of God. There's another person who really looks good from the outside with all the checklists and he's not accepted of God. Is that different than what we normally think? Mm -hmm. it, have you ever judged a person by their cover? Mm -hmm. yes. mm. yeah, Aren't you glad that God doesn't do that? <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> um, it, I know what it's like to grow up and looking like you've got everything right with you. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of you know that. You've been in a Christian environment. You have a little mask on, a facade, if you will. That was this, this Pharisee praying, I've got everything the way I have it. I, I don't need anything from you, God. I'm already good. In fact, I'm so glad I'm not like them. Mm -hmm. Do we do that? How is it possible to keep from trusting in our own righteousness? How is it possible? This is, this is just difficult, yes. It, it, a dangerous prayer we could pray because that kind of attitude could cause us to reject Jesus and be lost. Yes. Uh, one time a student asked me, you know, I, I don't feel the, the desire and I said, Ask God to show you your great need of Him. Mm. You could pray that prayer. Yes. Mm -hmm. Show me my great need of you, God. She came back to me several days later and said, don't ever tell anybody <laughs> to pray that without telling them, and God, hold me close to you when you show me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, it, you know, if we can pray like the psalmist, search me, O God, and know my heart. Amen. Yes. When... It, even, even, I think Peter was a good man. I mean, he was blessed by God, and yet he could fall. God, show me daily how much I desperately need you. Mm. And it's only by your grace, only through Jesus by faith, mm -hmm. that I am saved and I'm, I'm transformed. Mm. Um, I, I think we could pray that prayer. And, and, um, but, but say, God, while you show me, hold me close to you. Mm -hmm. Because I think it could be pretty traumatic to see how mm. much we need him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Will God answer a prayer like that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Sure. absolutely. Nathan. You, you asked how we can, I think you said something avoid like how do we avoid of, that yes. trap of our own self-righteousness. Okay. And I'm just thinking uh, one of my favorite little books that I like to read to just help me in my relationship with Christ is a book called Steps to Christ. Mm. And if I can paraphrase an expression from there, it says that the closer we come to Christ, the more faulty will appear in our own mm -hmm. sight. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem with this um, Pharisee was he was looking at himself. Yep. Look how good I am. Mm -hmm. Look at what, what a great job yeah. I'm doing. Absolutely. But as we come to, cl to Christ and we look at him, pretty soon we realize I'm not very good at all mm -hmm. compared to him. I see how the closer I get, the more faulty I see that I am. Yeah. And I say, Lord, I need your righteousness. Amen. I need that. And it's not of myself. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, Trisha Lee. I just want to add to Nathan's point, um, and I think that we can all be in danger of this, is so instead of watching Christ, we're, we're watching others. 
And I think it's a danger when you live in a community, right? I mean, like, we do have to work and live together. Yeah. But once you take your eyes off of Jesus, you start to watch other people, then you can start that kind of comparison. Well, I'm not as bad, or I'm doing a little bit better mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And then if everybody starts doing that, then you all kind of agree, like, okay, good, then we're doing better than that group over there, or that other community over there. And that's so dangerous. And instead of encouraging each other to look to Christ, we start encouraging each other to, to point out each other's faults, and that's a, a, the danger side of being in a community. And so I wanted to just kind of add to that is that we look to ourselves or we look to others instead of keeping our eyes focused on Christ. I really appreciate the things you've been saying, specifically the idea that I pray and I ask God to show me who I am. Yeah. Lord, reveal who I am to me mm. and have mercy on me. Help mm. me to realize who you are and to stay mm -hmm. close to you. And, and, and look to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The more we look to Jesus, the more we realize that we aren't what he is mm -hmm. yes. and what we need from him. Um, yeah, Seth. Uh, just to go back to an earlier point and just to add on to what Tricia Lee said, I, I think that the reason why Jesus becomes uh, the rock of offense or, you know, the better, the more hopeful alternative is, you know, he needs to shatter our, a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. mm. And that is very hopeful. It's, it's, it's redemptive yes. if we welcome that. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Thank you, Seth. And one last one, Julia. I actually have a question. If Jesus is our righteousness, how about the people that don't know Jesus and only believe in God? Or how about the Old Testament people that never met Jesus? It was way before them. What was their righteousness and how they can find it? It's a great question. I'm going to repeat it by Julia. I'm going to give it back to you. Okay? Ah. Uh, the people in the Old Testament, uh, if Christ is our righteousness and we realize that he is, what about the people in the Old Testament? Um, obviously, righteousness is necessary. What was their righteousness? Was it different? Maybe they were saved by keeping the law in the, in the Old Testament. Yeah. We have something yeah. different now. Mm -hmm. See, Nathan, then Trisha Lee, then Missy. I'll default <laughs> to my wife. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Missy. All right. I, would, I believe that's why uh, God gave them the visual um, gift of the sanctuary mm -hmm. so that they could have an understanding of who Jesus was would be for them. Yes. And in looking through that sacrificial system, they, they, they were able to understand it better. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, in fact, we read about Abraham, right? Yep. Yes. And in the same book here in Romans, mm -hmm. and it says he was believed and it was accounted to him as? Righteousness. righteousness. That's righteousness by? Faith. 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 That's what we've been looking at. Right. Yes, true. That was what I was going to, I was going to bring us back to Abraham. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Is there anything, Nathan? I, think, I just think, again, looking at Romans 10, verse 4, Christ is the end of, actually in the Greek it doesn't say the law, but the end of law for righteousness. So all the law was pointing to what? Christ. Christ. If this, the law of righteousness points us where? The end or the purpose, the fulfillment, the yes. completion of that. Yeah. Where does it bring us to? It ends with Christ. Christ. Right. It all comes to him. And so though they didn't have Christ, they did have the law, mm -hmm. which showed them this is the righteousness. This is the standard of God's character and what, what he requires. I can't meet up with that. And therefore, even though they didn't have Christ, they had all the indication of a, and, and the promises of a Messiah to come and say, Lord, I know he hasn't come yet, but I want yeah. that Messiah's righteousness for myself. And to believe that God can do something that you can't accomplish yourself. Mm -hmm. Because even, I mean, Abraham believed in the promise, right? That yes. He would have children and he couldn't or his wife couldn't. And he also believed and understood that there was a sacrificial substitute that was coming at mm -hmm. some point. Mm -hmm. And so his faith in, in, the, in what God could do for him in providing the child and providing a way for salvation, <clears throat> that was counted to him for righteousness even before Christ showed up and actually did the particular deed. So, yes. We have a huge <laughs> advantage because we have the story of Jesus. Yeah. Um, in the Old Testament, they had to look forward, like Missy said, you know, and, and of course John the Baptist, when he finally meets Jesus, says, this is the Lamb of yeah, God. Absolutely. Yeah. Everything, you know, back to Abraham and God will provide the Allah. sacrifice, the Lord will provide. They, they just had to trust God's promise and look forward to the mm -hmm. Messiah would come. We have the story. Mm -hmm. We have no excuse. Mm -hmm. Prophets and patriarchs would wish they could have, mm -hmm. have all of the story about the Messiah who mm -hmm. actually did come. And how tragic it is, 
and I think that's what really hurt Paul's heart for his own people. How tragic when we have the truth about salvation provided through Jesus, the Lamb of God, that we would go back to some old way of trying to earn God's favor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was six years old sitting in church, and I determined that I was going to be good. <laughs> you could say righteous today, but it was good in my mind then. I was not going to mess up again. Um, pretty bold decision for a six-year-old. And as I left that congregation, as I went out to the car and jumped in the car with my parents, I started a fight instantly with my sister. And it came to my mind, I failed. <laughs> and it was very strongly sunk into my brain at six years old, Chuck, you can't do this of yourself. So how do we get righteousness? Mm -hmm. I'd like to spend a little bit of time looking at how does one receive righteousness? And we're going to look at a couple passages, uh, Romans 3 and Romans 5, and then, and then some of the writings of John. Let's look at Romans 3, 21 to 26. Elaine, if you'd be willing to read that one. That's Romans 3, 21 through 26. Okay. How does one attain or receive righteousness? Uh, we'll be reading from the New Living Translation. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as we promised in the writings of Moses, as was promised in the writing of Mo, writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by, by placing our faith in, in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Amen. Verses 23, yeah. for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of, the glory, of God's glorious standard. Mm -hmm. Here it is clearly spelled out. How does a person become righteous? Faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. Absolutely. Let's continue reading. Let's look at verse 24 through 26. If, um, Daisy, would you be willing to continue reading that? I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Wow. So what does God declare us to be? Righteous. 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 When? We when we believe. We believe. Jesus. Beautiful passage. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. Yes. I just don't Nathan. want to miss it. That okay. When God makes a declaration, it's like when he spoke and he created. It's, it's, there's creative power in his word. And so when he declares us righteous, mm. he's doing a recreative act. Not, not that he's making us on our own righteous, you know, yes. by our own selves. But in Christ, he's making a declaration, a pronouncement. It's like it's legally standing now mm. before all the universe. God has made us righteous in Christ. Amen. Wow. That's powerful. I mean, that, that's something we can jump up and down and shout Amen. about. This is good news. <laughs> it's great it's really news. good news. Yes. Um, Romans chapter 5. Some more good news. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 5. Uh, I'd like to look at verse 12. And Stephanie, if you could read verse 12. Yes, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. And also verses 17 through 19. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteousness, righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, 
so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Amen. Thank you. Uh, what I really like in verse 17, how does it describe righteousness? It calls it something special. What is gift. it? A gift. 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 So I, I, I receive righteousness by faith, faith, but it's also called a gift. 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 Mm. It's not something that I earned in any way, shape, mm -hmm. or form. Mm. It's something that is given to me when I have faith in the one who's giving it. Yeah. Mm. Amen. It's beautiful. Yes, all right. It, it's, it's striking to me that when we, we, we read the text, I think it's in, um, where it says, in Romans, where it says, uh, the wages of sin yes. is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We see the gift, as you just mentioned, is life, but uh, wages for your sins is death. So like the, the works of the flesh, you trying to establish your own righteousness, in essence, uh, the wages for that is death. Because you, you will not meet the, the standard, the righteousness that God requires. Because His righteousness is not true works, mm -hmm. but it's actually a gift, His grace. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Daisy. Yeah, I used to think about this. I'm like, man, and I'm sure other people have thought about this before. I'm like, I'm suffering for the consequences of what Adam and Eve did. You know, it's, it says even before I was formed, you know, I, it's, the sin is engraved in my DNA. We're suffering the consequences of sin. Mm -hmm. And so people will complain like, oh, well, it was Adam's fault. Why am I suffering? But when I read this, it's like there's good news. You haven't done any good, but Jesus lived a righteous life but yet you get to enjoy the, the benefits of his righteousness. So even if you thought you're suffering for Adam's sin, hey, there's good news. Jesus Christ has lived a perfect life, and you get to enjoy that too. Amen. You know, Amen. It, Amen. Paul says Amen. that Jesus Christ was made to be sin for us, Amen. who knew no sin, that we might be made the what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Christ. 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 Amen. 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 I like to look at two passages quickly. Uh, that are some of my favorite uh, from the writer John. John chapter 17 and verse 3 and, so, and also 1 John 5, 11 through 12. John chapter 17 and verse 3. Nathan, would you read that for us? Sure. I'm reading John 17, 3 from the New King James Version. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Mm. Amen. First John chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. First John chapter 5, verses 11, let's do 11 through 13. Um, Julia, could you read it? Sure. And I'll, be I'll be reading from the New International Version. Verse 11 reads, And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God, Son of God, does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Wow. So where does eternal life come from? No, no. The Son who does it come from? Jesus. Jesus Christ. So what is the purpose of the law then? To, point. to lead us to, to, Christ. Christ. to lead us. Okay, let's look at a few passages. Okay, <laughs> Romans. Mm. Romans? I think it changes. Yes. Uh, I, when my heart is changed through mm. that accepting Christ by faith as my, not only my Savior, but my Lord. He's yes. Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, and I walk in a newness of life. I think I, think I, I view those, those, um, that counsel of God in a different way. Yes. From, from the bondage of trying to abide by things in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. I think something happens to my heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Romans chapter 6. And let's look at verse, um, verse 12. Romans 6 verse 12. And Juliana, would you be willing to read it? Yes. New King James Version says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey in its lusts. So here, Paul's pretty clear. Sin is not supposed to reign in my mortal body. Mm -hmm. this, this transgression of the law is not supposed to exist mm -hmm. in my body or reign in my body. So obviously the law still has some... Uh, it's not something I'm, I'm attempting to gain righteousness through keeping. Mm 
but it's still important. important. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Romans chapter 6, let's look at verse 15, 15 through 23. It's a little bit longer passage, 15 through 23. Tricia, thank you. I'm reading from the New King James Version. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are the one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in, term, in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So based upon this passage, what is wrong with this, the logic of, okay, I don't have to keep the law. I'm not saved by keeping the law, so I can do whatever I want. I don't have to obey anymore. What's wrong with that kind of uh, logic? Yeah. Yes, Stephanie, and then Pastor Derek and Ulrich, Steph. I think we miss, if we focus on that, we miss the fact that Christ has freed us from this disobedience, this life that was so far away from him. He wants to give us this newness of life. He wants to say, come and be my servant. I love you. And so service to me is beautiful. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Back to what I said about Jesus actually is the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. Then to become a slave of righteousness is, is not to become a slave of a list. It's, it's to say, Jesus, you have everything yes. of me. Mm -hmm. You've got my yes. heart. Absolutely. You've got my hopes, my dreams. Your agenda becomes my agenda. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, if I was doing that in a love relationship to try to earn his love, that would be an insult. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But it's because I'm his love child. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's like, you've got everything of me, God. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I think people who understand that we're not saved by keeping the law, but we're saved by grace through faith, are, are actually more earnest to live a holy life mm -hmm. because I just want to do what pleases God. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a slave's a hard word, but you know, I, can I just say I'm absolutely devoted surrendered to Jesus? Amen. Absolutely, Amen. yes, surrendered. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Ulrich. It's I, I like the way how Derek uh, framed it. I, I will use this analogy. Look at a marriage. When two people are in a, a, a happy marriage, yes, they took vows uh, at the ceremony and they know that along with this relationship, there are certain uh, stipulations and certain things that are there in place to maintain the happiness of that relationship. When that relationship starts to break down and someone is feeling unhappy in that relationship, so to speak, then those stipulations that were meant to keep the happiness all of a sudden becomes a burden and one or both of them starts to complain. Now the, the, the keeping of those rules just to maintain the relationship becomes troublesome because the love, the relationship has broken down, that bond has broken down. So the way in which you put it is very good in that the law is not there uh, to make the relationship. It is there to keep the happiness in the relationship because it is the relationship make, that makes the rule uh, viable. Without a relationship, th there's no need for, for, for that law. So this is God's way of saying we are in a relationship. And to maintain that happiness and that bond, there are some stipulations here. 
You know, this leads me to a kind of our final question that I'd like to spend a little bit of time looking at is knowing that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for you and I. How does that affect our ability to do what we've been talking about this whole uh, quarter so far? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbors yourself. How does it set you free to experience that more fully? Yes, if I think about walking in the newness of the spirit and Christ living in my heart, I think about um, what Missy mentioned um, about Christ working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Of my own, I, my own heart is wicked of itself, but if I allow Christ to come into my heart, I've surrendered to him, I'm devoted to him, he's actually going to come in and start to change things so that it's not even just me desiring it, because how much can I really desire that? But he'll work in me to help me want to keep his law, to help me want to live a righteous life, and then he'll help me come back and help me to even do those things through him. So I feel like it's, he helps to motivate me and helps me to do it. it. Sounds to me as I'm listening to you that Christ is doing everything. He's doing everything. Okay. <laughs> yes, I see. I was just going to say, if you dare to give your heart to God, watch out. You don't know what kind mm -hmm. of changes you're going to see within yourself <laughs> to will and do according to his good pleasure. Amen. Yes, Amen. yes. Juliana. You cannot fully love until you understand that you are loved. Mm. Mm. And mm. when you understand that you are loved of God, then you will be able to return that love to him mm. and to your fellow man. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Seth. Uh, I'm, I'm intrigued by a statement that David had, you know, was able to make about the law of God, you know, saying that he loved the law. And, you know, he viewed it in a totally positive uh, mm -hmm. way, like mm -hmm. the significance of the law. Uh, Amen. I know the Holy Spirit can make that true for us as well. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. You know, I believe as we've been looking at this lesson that Christ can do a miracle in our lives. Amen. Amen. When we realize that he loves us, that he frees us from trying to save ourselves, trying mm -hmm. to produce our own righteousness, that he's given us his righteousness. What great things he can do. Amen. Amen. I'm excited about that. Pastor Thanks Gary. so much, Chuck. What a, what a great study. And you know, I'm, I'm excited, as uh, Missy said, well, God's going to work a miracle yeah. in us. And what, what a change can happen in your life. And, and, and set you free, thank you, Juliana, out of a love, heart filled with love. To, to, to live a totally different life in the newness of the Spirit, mm -hmm. totally in harmony with His will. Let's pray that that can happen for each one of us. Lord God, thank you that what you have in mind for us is, is more than we could even imagine, that we could live in, in beautiful harmony with you, that our lives would give you praise, a life transformed by the power of Jesus. And I pray a prayer of thanks for Jesus has saved us and that he is able to transform us. May your name be honored in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School today. Again, what a life-changing journey. If you missed any, come back and join us again as we continue to study because God has an awesome plan for you, not just to bless you, but through you to bless those around you.